Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 292nd episode, we have a bunch of news, including a pair of new dinosaurs, as well as about a dozen baby dinosaurs that were discovered and all sorts of cool dinosaur embryo action happening. We also have Dinosaur of the Day Enigmasaurus. And as always, we'd like to thank some of our patrons for helping us to keep this podcast running all these years. And this week, we'd like to thank Lucas and Eli, Wyatt, the Georges family, John Heck, Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire, Ray, Andrew and Helena Webb, Callum, Ricky, William, Red Sox Rex, Wouter, Moss Utah Raptor, Verosaraptor, Goji, Neilovenator, Aussie David, Ellen, Christine, and Diplodicate. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really awesome seeing this community grow, and I'm loving all of the names people are giving us to shout out. Yes, and we've passed the end of the month, which means now all of our patrons are going to be getting our special Sabrina made dinosaur art in the mail. Yay! So if you want to join our community and chat with fellow dinosaur enthusiasts on our Discord, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. So jumping into the news up first, we have our new dinosaur eggs, also known as like over a dozen dinosaur embryos. It's amazing. Yeah. They come first because there's so many more of them than the other pair. (laughs) So this article was written by Mark Norell and a bunch of other people and published in Nature. And so as always for a Nature article, it's very dense because it's a magazine. And so it's only like two or three pages long. And there weren't nearly enough pictures of these eggs in it. I was kind of disappointed. I was hoping they have all sorts of like CT scans and all sorts of data like that. But it's really more about how dinosaur eggs may have evolved from soft to hard. So we've talked a little bit about it before. There's been debate about whether or not dinosaur eggs started out as hard or soft. Most of the soft dinosaur eggshell origin proponents point out that fossils are really rare in the Triassic and you might expect fossils to be rare if they were soft eggshells because they're just way less likely to preserve. They don't have as much mineral in them. So just like how dinosaur bones preserve, but most of the other parts of the dinosaur very rarely fossilize, the same might go for soft eggshells. The other big piece of evidence is that the early tetrapods, you can think of things like amphibians coming up out of the water, most of those had soft eggshells. It seems to be the ancestral condition of these animals coming up out of the water when they were in the water. They almost all had soft eggshells. So on land, they had soft eggshells and then they had to evolve hard eggshells later. So that's kind of the soft eggshell side of the argument. But on the other side, there are a lot of people that think that the origins of dinosaur eggshells may have been hard. So One of the best pieces of evidence is that all living relatives of dinosaurs, meaning birds and crocodilians, have hard eggshells. And usually what you can do is you can take all of the modern ancestors of an animal, and if they all have the same feature, you assume that their common ancestor had that same feature. But there's always the possibility that each of those animals evolved that condition separately. So it's kind of a convergent evolution thing. The other good argument for hard-shelled eggs and them being early dinosaur characteristics is that hard eggs tend to survive better. So there's maybe an evolutionary bias to the animal that might have hard-shelled eggs. And there were multiple extinction events that happened throughout dinosaurs' time ruling the Earth, excluding now, I guess. And it might have helped, say, between the Triassic and Jurassic if they had hard eggshells while lots of other things went extinct. You might think, well, maybe dinosaurs survived because they had hard eggshells. So this has been a big question for a long time. And now we have potentially an answer. There's a new find, actually two new finds, of Protoceratops and Musaurus eggs found on completely different parts of the earth. The Protoceratops is late Cretaceous in Mongolia. So basically at the end of dinosaurs and Protoceratops being a Ceratopsian is a really derived group that didn't even exist until the Cretaceous. And on the other end of the spectrum, we got a Musaurus, which is either from the late Triassic or early Jurassic of Argentina. So it's the opposite side of the world. It's very early in dinosaur evolution and it's a sauropodomorph that There wasn't anything looking even remotely like this dinosaur by the time we got to the 
Cretaceous. The closest things are the true sauropods, but they don't really look that much like an early sauropodomorph. So the cooler find, in my opinion, is the protoceratops. They say they found, quote, at least 12 eggs and embryos, six of which preserve nearly complete skeletons. Wow. End quote. Yeah, it's astonishing. And the pictures of it are amazing. Mongolia just has some of the best fossils that you see anywhere. They are constant. There's just always something new, like the protoceratops that's engaged in conflict with that velociraptor Mm -hmm. came from mongolia and it's all like 3d preserved the sandstone there is just amazing the way that it preserves things in like 3d representations all the time and it seems like it must be pretty easy to prepare too because sandstone i don't think is that hard in this case and yeah it's just it makes some beautiful stuff and the bones usually come out white too which is really interesting Hmm. because a lot of times fossils are like gray or you know, darker color. But in Mongolia, they seem to come out white a lot of the time, which is really striking. Something about that sandstone. It's amazing. Of these dozen plus <laughs> dinosaur embryos, most of them look like basically they're still in the exact 3D shape they were in all those millions of years ago, like 70 million years ago. So basically, it looks like if you took an egg and it had a bird or a dinosaur in it, and then everything in it solidified and you just kind of trimmed off the egg from the outside of it and then trimmed down the inside of the egg so that you could see the animal inside it, that's what it looks like. It just looks like these egg-shaped rocks with embryos of dinosaurs inside that shape of rock. Hmm. And then like it was... I think they were prepared down to the bones themselves. So they're all just kind of sticking out. It looks so cool. And it looks like they're all just kind of jumbled up like they were in a nest or something. It's just one of the coolest finds I've ever seen. Looking closely at the bones, the researchers could tell that they were unfused and mostly not even really bone. They were saying they were not ossified, which means they were probably still like a little bit cartilage or something. And... That means that they were almost certainly embryos because your bones need to be ossified (laughs) in order to hatch and survive. The smallest of the embryos is only 15% smaller than the largest, which is considered really close in size. And at first I was like 15%, that's kind of a big difference. But then I remember the dinosaurs at most laid only one or two eggs a day. So if there were over a dozen of them, that means these were laid over the period of at least six days. And dinosaurs aren't like people where it takes nine months for them to be ready to pop out of their eggs. Dinosaurs usually, we think, hatched in like three to four months kind of time frame. So if you're talking about a week of difference, you could easily see how you'd have a 15% difference in size from the smallest to largest. They did say a couple of the eggs are quote unquote potentially hatched Hmm. because they're not in that curled up very much in an egg shape. And they said that there's a faint egg outline around them, whereas on the other dinosaur embryos, there's that eggshell shape or egg shape of rock around them. And you can really faintly see on most of them this little tiny line that looks like it's an eggshell that's going around it, Hmm. but not so much on the ones that are kind of splayed out. It's really hard to see, though. It's not like the kind of eggshells we're used to seeing, the hard eggshells, like at Egg Mountain in Two Medicine Formation where Myasaur is. It looks like a piece of ostrich shell or something. It's much thicker even than like a chicken egg shell. Hmm. This is like just a faint little line that you can barely see. On the other side of the earth, both back in the Mesozoic and today, is Musaurus, which like I said was from the late Triassic, so it's way earlier in dinosaur evolution. The picture isn't nearly as pretty. Argentinian finds just tend to not be as beautiful (laughs) as the ones that you get from Mongolia. But it does very clearly show the egg, even more clearly than you see in the protoceratops find. I think it might be because of the way it was prepared. It looks like they just kind of left it as an egg shape and didn't dig down into it as much. So mostly the picture of the Musaurus egg that they share is just a dark egg. (laughs) It just looks like a, a dark egg. You can't even tell that there's anything inside it. They must have done a CT scan or something to see in it, but it doesn't say anything about that in the paper and there's no pictures. Maybe it's a future paper. Yeah, I kind of assume so. And I wonder because Mark Norell is from the American Museum of Natural History and he's working with fossils that are from Mongolia and Argentina. I'm wondering if those museums... If he made some kind of agreement where he wasn't going to publish all of the detail about these finds. So, you know, local paleontologists could do some work on it or something. 
But even though there's only the picture of just kind of the one outside of the Musaurus egg, they know that there's a Musaurus embryo inside, and they say that, quote, several eggs preserve embryonic and juvenile specimens, end quote. So there must be quite a find there as well. We just can't see it. (laughs) So getting into whether or not these eggshells were soft or hard-shelled, I want to give a quick definition of what a soft versus a hard eggshell is, because... I mean, obviously, soft eggshells are soft and hard eggshells are hard. (laughs) But if you're looking at them in a paleontological context, anything that preserves becomes hard because it gets mineralized and fossilized. So you can't just squeeze it and see if it's soft or hard. You have to know a lot about the actual structure of the eggshell of a soft versus a hard eggshell in order to compare them. So for a hard eggshell, you've got three parts. There's the middle part which is the main part you think of with an eggshell. It's the hard calcium matrix. It's known as calcite, which is a form of calcium carbonate, if you're interested in that kind of thing. And then there's a little bit of protein mixed in for strength because it would be really brittle if it was just calcium carbonate. The middle layer is full of tons of pores. You can't see them with the naked eye, but they're really important because they let oxygen in and carbon dioxide out, which there's a living thing growing inside it and basically breathing, so it needs these pores. And the middle layer is by far the thickest part of the hard eggshell. On the inside of the eggshell is a membrane which regulates gas and water exchange. It also helps to keep eggs from cracking. I read when I was trying to figure out how thick the membrane was versus the middle of an eggshell. I I was Googling around and I kept finding people online saying, I have a chicken coop. And the eggs have such a thick membrane that it's really hard to crack them. (laughs) Wow. Like, what should I do? So apparently what people do is they just keep them for a week or two and the membrane shrinks quite a bit and then it's easier to crack them. So I don't know exactly how thick these membranes are. I found some places that measured them, but I wonder with the testing protocol, like how close to the laying they were measuring it and things. Right. It's hard to imagine because when I think of when you hard boil a chicken egg and you peel that shell and there's that yeah that thin membrane that comes off usually when you're taking off the shell yeah and it seems like wow it's crazy to think that could be so thick it'd be hard to crack that yeah (laughs) that's true and i think too when you crack the egg you're actually only peeling off half of the membrane i'm not sure about that but there's an inner and an outer membrane and i'm not sure if one of them when you hard boil it might stick to the like albumin white part and the other part might stick to the egg shell part and then again also those are unfertilized eggs so i i don't know if fertilizing it makes that membrane thicker so it, there's there seems to be a lot of variables on the membrane thickness but from what i could tell it seems like it's about a tenth of the thickness of the middle hard egg shell part so in most representations i've seen it's quite a bit thinner on a hard shelled egg and then There's one last layer that people often leave out, but I think is incredibly important, and it's the outside of the eggshell, which has a waxy, quote-unquote, cuticle, which protects the pores from bacteria entering, and obviously most likely killing the dinosaur, and it also helps to keep moisture in, because that membrane allows moisture to pass through it, but it can get overwhelmed if it's really dry out, and it can pull too much moisture through the membrane. This is by far the thinnest layer in a chicken egg. It's about six micrometers thick, which is like a tenth of a human hair. Um, It might be about half the thickness of the membrane to much less than half, depending on how thick the membrane is. But yeah, so you've got those three parts. You've got the outside part, which is basically an antibacterial layer. Then you've got the part that everybody knows about, the thick calcium part. And then the inside has that membrane that regulates gas and water exchange. And that's all the shell. So if you say the shell, you're not just talking about that calcium part. It's all three of those combined. On the soft-shelled egg side of things, it's basically the same sort of general structure, but you get much less, if any, calcite, and instead there's an extra thick membrane. So what it ends up looking like is just a whole bunch of membrane and not really any calcite, if any. Hmm. But there's a bunch of different versions of hard and soft-shelled eggs with different variations on the structure. So soft-shelled eggs, some of them have no calcite, some of them have a little bit, some of them have a little bit on the inside, some of them have a little bit on the outside. (laughs) can be all sorts of combinations. But the gist is if there's too much calcite, it's going to be hard-shelled. So it has to have way more membrane. 
Didn't know there was so much variation in eggs. Yeah, it's crazy. With dinosaurs on the hard-shelled egg side, we found them from hadrosaurs. Myasaura, I think, is by far the most famous dinosaur that's associated with eggs. We've also found them from sauropodomorphs, mostly titanosaurs, and theropods, but it's usually really hard to tell the genus and species. We know with Myasaur because we just have a ton of examples of them and they're clearly breeding grounds and have all these embryos associated. But with the other ones, usually you just find the egg and there's no embryo with it. Even in these three cases, these three different groups have very different calcite layers and structures within the hard-shelled eggs. But I should mention, too, that the membrane I think usually fossilizes too. I see a lot of reference in papers to what the membrane looks like and how thick it is and stuff like that. So I think it usually fossilizes, but I'm not totally sure if it always does or if those are just the ones that get published on. <laughs> but we, we do know a lot about what the membrane part of a dinosaur eggshell looked like, which is obviously very helpful. So jumping ahead to our new dinosaur finds, on the protoceratops side, what they found was there was about 300 micrometers of semi-transparent carbon-rich material over about a 30 micrometer layer of crystalline, probably calcite or something like that. So if you're looking at that ratio, there's 10 times as much membrane type stuff as that calcite. It's probably a soft shell egg. In addition to that, the amazing preservation of this fossil allows you to see the shape of the egg that it was when it was buried and it looks like they got squished a little bit without breaking which is obviously another very good sign that it was soft shelled on the other hand musaurus even though being a much larger egg because this is from a much larger dinosaur it was only about 120 micrometers thick but it was also a similar dark brown semi-transparent carbon rich film so it also looks like it was probably a soft-shelled egg. I thought it was kind of funny because in the paper, they described the eggs as originally non-biomineralized. <laughs> what? <laughs> because if, cause if you're a dinosaur laying a hard-shelled egg, you have to biomineralize it. Oh, I see. Before you lay it, yeah. But these were mineralized eventually. And it, I guess it could be biomineralized depending on what solidified it. But it wasn't done so most likely by the dinosaur. It was done during fossilization. To double check, they compared the chemical makeup using Raman spectroscopy of these eggs to lots of other types of soft-shelled and hard-shelled eggs. And they seem to line up with the soft-shell side of things. Although chemistry on fossils is always kind of dicey because <laughs> over tens of millions of years they break down a little bit. And they also compared them to soft turtle eggs and saw a lot of similarities. But the main focus of the paper really was about taking these new findings of these two really awesome new dinosaur finds and expanding it into what we might know about dinosaurs as a whole. And the title of the paper is actually The First Dinosaur Egg Was Soft. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell where they're putting their nickel down in terms of hard versus soft. That would explain all the headlines. Yeah, it did make a lot of headlines. Usually when nature has a dinosaur article, it makes a lot of headlines. But the way the researchers got to this conclusion that the first dinosaur eggs were soft was by putting the musaurus and protoceratops eggs into a phylogenetic tree, letting a computer crunch through the possibilities with other dinosaur eggshells we know about. And basically it ended up saying, yeah, the most simple explanation is that the first dinosaur egg was soft, but then hard shell eggs had to evolve three separate times, which is kind of crazy, but not that surprising because those three separate branches of hard-shelled eggs look very different. So it's not like you're seeing the same hard-shelled egg all over the place and it came from a common ancestor. You're seeing different-looking hard-shelled eggs. So sure, why not? <laughs> Could have evolved separately. I'm really not surprised, though, that the phylogenetic tree came up with this because basically Protoceratops and Musaurus are about as distant as relatives as you can get <laughs> in the dinosaur family tree. And usually when you put in new data that has these really distant relatives with a shared common trait, it's going to come out that their ancestor had that trait as well, in this case, a soft-shelled egg. Plus, they included that pterosaurs had soft-shelled eggs. And the general thinking now is that pterosaurs are one of the closest relatives to dinosaurs that isn't a living ancestor. So maybe the common ancestor of dinosaurs and pterosaurs 
had soft-shelled eggs, and then dinosaurs had them for a while before separately evolving this hard-shelled eggs. The weirdest thing to me, though, is that Protoceratops had soft-shelled eggs. Because what is this thing doing in the late Cretaceous? Everybody else has hard-shelled eggs. <laughs> it's trying something different. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it's so strange. Evolution is weird. It is too weird. <laughs> And up next, we've got our pair of new dinosaurs. They're both Ceratopsians, in fact. And they were described by Denver Fowler and Elizabeth Friedman Fowler, husband-wife team. And they published this in Pure J. So unlike the Nature article, which is about two pages long, this one's about 50-something, because Pure J, I don't think, has a limit on how long (laughs) you make it. They tend to have really long articles. But that is fantastic, because that means you get all of the dinosaur glory you could be interested in. Plus, Pure J is open access, unlike nature. So if you're interested in this, you can get in there and really <laughs> read every detail you could possibly want about these dinosaurs. So these two dinosaurs are named Navajo Ceratops and Terminocavus. And both of them were found in the San Juan Basin in New Mexico. We've been talking a lot about finds in the San Juan Basin of New Mexico lately. It's a pretty good spot to find some dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Especially Ceratopsians. Yes. Yeah. In the paper, the authors point out that this is one of the best places to find ceratopsians outside of where you find triceratops. So definitely a great spot to look. So Navajo ceratops is named, full name is Navajo ceratops Sullivani. And Navajo ceratops is after the Navajo people plus horned face because it's a ceratopsian. So you got to have ceratops at the end. And then Sullivani is after Dr. Robert M. Sullivan, who was the leader of the State Museum of Pennsylvania expedition, which found the fossils decades ago. The other dinosaur is Terminocavus celii, even though I just said you have to have ceratops at the end if it's ceratopsian, you clearly don't. (laughs) Terminocavus comes from combining the words terminus and cavity, basically. So it means coming to the end of the cavity. Intrigue. Sounds really weird, but it'll make sense in a minute. <laughs> and then Celii is after Paul Seely, who discovered the holotype specimen. And even though I said there's two new dinosaur genera, there was actually a third, but they didn't name it. They just call it Taxon C. And that's because it's way too incomplete to deserve a name. It looks really different than Navajo Ceratops and Terminocavus, and basically any other Ceratopsian that you could compare it to. So it's probably a new genus, but. There's no sense in naming it. It's basically just the little bit. All of these dinosaurs have those two big holes in their frill, like Taurosaurus. And it's basically a little piece that goes in between those holes. So it's not a very diagnostic piece. You usually want kind of the edge of the frill or some horns at least. So this doesn't deserve a name. I'm glad they didn't name it. I wonder if that'll add fuel to the debate on Taurosaurus. So these are in a different branch. They're more in like the Chasmosaurus side of things than close to Taurosaurus. But... It is very much a lumpy, splitty sort of situation because we're looking at these subtle changes in the frill. And I could see somebody making the case like they're very close in age that maybe there is just some individual variation or age variation happening. Although they are similar in size, which is a big help. In all their drawings, they have them drawn to scale and they're like pretty close. Whereas Taurosaurus or adult Triceratops, (laughs) if you prefer that way of thinking, tends to always be larger. So the case for being the same species is a little better, I think, for Triceratops. Denver Fowler was actually on the team that collected Navajo Ceratops way back in 2002, which is probably why he's half of the authors on this. And there's a locality that's nicknamed Denver's Blowout, (laughs) which I wonder if there's a story there like Denver Fowler freaked out and they just named this place after it. Or... Denver found it, and there's so many fossils there. It's a blowout of fossils or something. It could be. Or like some kind of geological feature where something was like blown out. It's possible. Next time we talk to him, we're going to have to ask. The differences between Navajo Ceratops and Terminocavus from Pentaceratops and Anchiceratops are minor enough that the Fowlers are proposing that this might be an example of anagenesis or kind of direct evolution. So they might just be in between Pentaceratops and Anchiceratops. Like it evolved directly between these different individuals. So basically what they're saying is that there's this Pentaceratops lineage, as they're calling it. And back in Utah, 
in the Kuiperowitz formation at about 75 to 76 million years ago. We had Utah Ceratops, and it's got these two really large holes in its frill, way bigger than you see on Taurosaurus, and then kind of a thin frill going around the edge, as well as that dividing line that goes down through the middle between the two openings, and lots of epiossifications up around the edge. And then in the middle, there's a kind of a dip. Kind of heart-shaped? Yeah, that's a really good way to describe it. So there's that kind of heart dip in the top. With Pentaceratops, you see a really similar thing, but Pentaceratops isn't in Utah. It's over in New Mexico, and it's a couple hundred thousand years (laughs) younger (laughs) about. So it's possible that Utah Ceratops evolved directly into Pentaceratops, and that opening has gotten a little bit bigger. So that heart dip (laughs) in the top has kind of expanded a little bit. The new dinosaur, Navajo Ceratops, kind of continues this trend. It's still further a little bit younger by a couple hundred thousand, maybe half a million years. And now that heart shape is kind of closing in. So if you have the two bumps of the heart on the top and you kind of stretch them to connect (laughs) up above the heart and you kind of have just like a little teardrop dip in between, that's kind of what Navajo Ceratops looks like. But the edge of the frill is generally about the same. And then when you get to Terminocavus, another couple hundred thousand years later, it looks like, because it's still farther up in the layer cake of the formation, that heart shape is starting to like close up. So now there's just a little tiny teardrop left extending down into the frill, and there isn't that much of a dip anymore. Interestingly, they connected it to that last dinosaur, which is Anchiceratops, and that's actually from Alberta, Canada. So we we're starting in Utah, then we've got three of them in New Mexico, and then the last one's in Alberta, Canada. <laughs> and the way Anchiceratops looks, it doesn't at first look like it belongs in this list because it doesn't have any sort of dip in the frill there. But what it has instead are these two little epiossification looking things, but they're sticking out from that space where the dip used to be. So if you imagine that frill as it curves around down into that heart shape, if it had an epiossification there, the epiossifications would be pointing right at each other and running into each other. Hmm. And then once it completely closed with Anchiceratops, they just kind of passed one another. And that's the first time that you actually see them. So it's like it's a weird thing, but it's kind of got these epiossifications sticking out of the middle of its frill. When you look at it, you're like, why does it have that? That's so strange. But if it does fit along this family tree, in Pentaceratops, you see a little bit of that same thing. You see these epiossifications in that much larger heart-shaped dip. So maybe they just kind of came and went a little bit, or maybe these are younger individuals, or who knows what. But with Anchiceratops, you could make an argument that it's right along that same lineage. It's definitely a very clean and nice way to explain the evolution. Anagenesis is always pretty and pleasant (laughs) in that way where you talk about one dinosaur going directly into the next but it's super hard to prove and it's probable that it was really some similar dinosaur and these are more like cousins but yeah i like it the fowlers also threw in a chasmosaurus lineage into the paper and i think they did that because Previously, it's been proposed that some of these dinosaurs were related in different ways, so they wanted to just kind of break it out in their preferred lineage. And with Chasmosaurus, what they show is you've got Chasmosaurus russeli, which is like a million or two years older than Utah Ceratops, but it's up from Alberta, Canada. And then you've got Chasmosaurus belli, which is, you know, a couple hundred thousand years later, also in Alberta, Canada. And they kind of have little bit of that heart shape but it's like if the heart opening is really broad like super broad like kind of squish the heart down and widen that gap in the middle and going from chasmosaurus russeli to belli it gets even wider the next one in their anagenesis proposal is vagaceratops which has this curl of epiossifications over the top it doesn't really have a dip anymore But then the last one in their list is Cosmoceratops, which is no longer in Alberta. Now it's in Utah, and it has that crazy frill. (laughs) A lot of people know about Cosmoceratops because it almost looks like it has hair. It's got (laughs) so many epiossifications curling over the front of the frill, these bumps all over the place, that it just looks like it's got hair hanging down, like bangs (laughs) hanging down on the front of its frill. 
And it does kind of match with Vagaceratops. Vagaceratops looks like it has like baby bangs. <laughs> and then Cosmoceratops got like crazy Jim Halpert in the early office, like bangs all over the place, getting in his eyes, sort of level of bangs. You can tell what we've been watching lately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they... So these authors are saying they've got the Penaceratops lineage and the Chasmoceratops lineage. I'm not sure why they call it the Penaceratops lineage and not the Utahceratops lineage since Utahceratops was earlier. Maybe it's because Penaceratops was named earlier. I don't know. They do say that they really like Penaceratops as a name and that we probably need a new holotype or a neotype because Penaceratops is a pretty well-known genus, but the holotype is missing some important details of the edge of the frill. So... Maybe that's why they call it the Penaceratops lineage. They're trying to solidify that argument for needing a better Penaceratops. The other big interesting piece to this paper is that it seems to show that travel between northern and southern Laramidia was still possible in the late Cretaceous at a time when a lot of people have said that these dinosaurs were completely separated. So as a quick reminder, Laramidia is the western part of North America, and during the late Cretaceous, there was this western interior seaway that separated the east from the west. But more importantly, in terms of these Ceratopsians, is that in the time period around when these Ceratopsians were evolving, the western interior seaway expanded a lot to the point where Laramidia, that western chunk, was mostly just the Rocky Mountains. So for really large herbivores like this, it's been proposed that they got kind of stuck because they couldn't, they would have had to like basically climb the mountains <laughs> to go from north to south. But in this case, we're seeing a little bit of mixing between Utah, New Mexico, and Alberta, Canada, which is clearly the northern and southern branches of Laramidia. So, yeah, if it works out that these are in anagenesis, it definitely shows that they weren't permanently separated. But at the same time, it could be an argument for sort of temporary separations like temporary enough for some of these individuals to evolve and then mix up some more later and redistribute around the continent. I always think it's kind of weird when we talk about sea levels over the course of millions of years, as if there were like 10 million year stretches when the sea level was constant and it completely separated groups based on sea level alone. Because we know from living on earth that sea level changes for all sorts of different reasons over the period of like tens of thousands of years. So yeah, it just seems a little crazy to me to say that none of these animals could have gone north to south or south to north for 10, 20 million years. Just seems kind of unbelievable. And that seems to be what this is showing too. In other dinosaur news, thank you, Neil, who shared this update with us about the Crystal Palace Megalosaur. So Crystal Palace dinosaurs got a lot of donations to repair the dinosaur, and so far they've met with an architect and structural engineer to assess the damage, and they also had a volunteer photogrammetry team document all the fragments with 3D data to help understand the breakage patterns. And they've met with a hydrology survey contractor and security professionals to look for ways to make it harder for people to trespass on the islands. Sounds like a lot of steps have been taken. Yeah, I know when we were visiting, we saw a group <laughs> just go over onto the island because basically all they had to do was hop a small fence and then walk along a pretty easy little dam that's set up to kind of separate some of the features in the lake. And yeah, it was like a cakewalk basically to get over there. Mm -hmm. And while we were there, we were with a bunch of people who preserved these dinosaurs and yelling at them like, get off the island. What are you doing over there? <laughs> and then the people got off. But obviously, if in the middle of the night or if these if people that care about the dinosaurs aren't there, then who knows what happens? Well, things like what happened to the megalosaur happened. Yeah, exactly. It's a bummer. But I'm glad they got donations and they're able to do something about this. Yeah. Next, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History is opening a new exhibition that's going to run from now until July 5th of 2021. Wow. So plenty of time. <laughs> uh, it's called Dinosaur Armor, and it's all about the development of armor. And there's specimens, casts, there's art of invertebrates, fish, reptiles, dinosaurs, and mammals. Garrett's giving a look of joy. I love animal armor. It's just so cool. So if you want to visit, you do have to buy tickets in advance because there are uh, different safety measures in place. So, for example, you do have to wear a mask and all tickets are timed so that there's only a small number of people going through the exhibit at, at once. 
There aren't a lot of things that would get me into a museum right now, but if we lived near the Carnegie Museum, I'd be really tempted to go. Well, we've got a year, so <laughs> we'll see what happens. That's so cool. I like that they include invertebrates and fish and stuff, too. Mm-hmm. Some of the fish armor is the craziest, like the Dunkleosteus and those ones that are basically like their skeleton is kind of armor. And <laughs> so many ways that you can have armor. So cool. Maybe it's because I'm so, as a human, so squishy and vulnerable all the time. I'm jealous of these armored animals. <laughs> if you were an egg, you'd be a soft egg. Yes, definitely. <laughs> and last, in Florida... Make-A-Wish South Florida threw a surprise dinosaur-themed car parade for six-year-old Maverick Bouchard Miranda. His wish was to meet Chris Pratt. Uh, That's been postponed because of COVID-19. So for now, they held the parade, and that included a fire truck and dozens of cars. And then Make-A-Wish said that this is an enhanced wish. (laughs) And Maverick's wish will happen. It's just postponed for now. Nice. Yeah, that was a nice feel-good story. And now on to our dinosaur of the day. Enigmasaurus, which was a request from Lickspieler via our Discord and Patreon, so thanks. Enigmasaurus was a Therizinosaur theropod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Mongolia, found in the Bayan Sharef Formation. I love a good Therizinosaur. Me too. <laughs> it's estimated to be 16.4 feet or 5 meters long and weigh between 1 and 2,000 pounds or 450 to 900 kilograms. It's about the same weight as a horse. Enigmasaurus was bipedal, herbivorous, maybe omnivorous. The type and only species is Enigmasaurus mongoliensis, and the genus name means enigma lizard or enigmatic lizard, and that's from the Greek word that means mysterious. There's a perfect name for a Therizinosaur. Yes. They're very mysterious. Why the long claws and crazy head and everything? (laughs) Every single feature about it, basically. (laughs) Yeah. So a well-preserved pelvis and other remains were found, and that includes a large left femur, which is too large to be clearly associated with the pelvis. And Enigmasaurus was named because of the unusual shape of the pelvis. So this specific feature. The pelvis is large, then the pubis bones point backward, and that's why it's enigmatic. Mm. It was first reported in 1979 when its pelvis was compared to other theropods, but not too much was known about therizinosaurs yet. So was that, why is a theropod clearly look like an herbivore? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Enigma. (laughs) It was nicknamed the dinosaur from Karakutal, the locality in the formation where it was found, and was considered part of Segnosauria when briefly described by Rinchen Barsbold and Altandrel Pearl in 1980. Then it was officially named and described in 1983 by Barsbold. It's based on a partial skeleton, no skull, with the well-preserved pelvic girdle. And again, the type species is Enigmasaurus mongoliensis, and that species name refers to Mongolia. There may have been an older adult specimen found based on the pelvis having areas of bone resorption and bone remodeling of the ilium, the uppermost largest part of the hip bone, that could be a unique characteristic of Enigmasaurus, but it would need more analysis. Enigmasaurus is possibly synonymous with Erlichosaurus, which is a medium-sized herbivorous dinosaur with a small skull and beak and was also one of the dinosaurs in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Both were found in the same formation, but the pelvis of Erlichosaurus is unknown, so it's hard to compare them and determine if Enigmasaurus is a junior synonym. On the other hand, the Enigmasaurus pelvis doesn't look like the pelvis of Segnosaurus, which is another Therizinosaur from the same formation. <laughs> Lots of Therizinosaurs there. Awesome. Also, Ehrlichosaurus and Enigmasaurus were found in different strata, so most scientists consider them to be separate taxon. And just to add to how many Therizinosaurs were there, the, a third Therizinosaur had also been found in the same formation. Mongolia, man. They got lots of cool stuff. Yeah. So in addition to the Therizinosaurs, an unnamed Velociraptorine has been found in the same time and place. And they also found a lot of fossil fruits. So there were many angiosperm plants around at the time that they lived. And just for fun, the first Cretaceous Therizinosaur found in Mongolia was Therizinosaurus colaniformis, named in 1954, but it was found in a different formation, in the Nemet formation. Enigmasaurus may have had good hearing and a good sense of smell. That's based on a CT scan of Erlichosaurus and partial brain cases of two other Therizinosaurs in a 2019 study. And this would have been helpful for foraging, avoiding predators, and acting socially. Nice. 
I think if I had known about Therizinosaurs as a kid, they would have been a strong contender for my favorite dinosaur. Based on the way you reacted to the armored animal exhibition, I don't know. Yeah, it was a close second. I used to always want to combine a Stegosaurus and an Ankylosaurus because I was like, you'd have the plates, which would be better armor. But it turns out you don't need that. So Ankylosaurus is definitely better. (laughs) Especially when it comes to armor. And our fun fact of the day is in honor of Canada Day. Happy Canada Day to all of our Canadian listeners. There are at least six dinosaur genera named in honor of Canada or its provinces slash territories. There are also tons of Canadian dinosaurs named after specific Canadian cities, formations, and Canadians. Hmm. (laughs) But since Canada Day is kind of about the country, I'm just going to focus on the Canada and provinces slash territories. So province territory wise, there's a whole bunch named after Alberta. You've got Alberta Ceratops, Alberta Venator. And then we've got the male version of Alberta for some reason with Alberto Nikus and Alberto Saurus. I don't know why they didn't just make it Alberta Sora, but I mean, we do know why. It's because there's a masculine bias with using Saurus rather than Sora. But I think that's it in terms of province or territory names. Mm. I couldn't find a single non Alberta <laughs> province or territory in a genus name. My guess for why that is is because so many dinosaurs have been found in Alberta. Yes, definitely. But there were there have been dinosaurs found in Saskatchewan. We were just talking about that. Not enough, I guess, to have the names. It could also just be that Saskatchewanosaurus sounds a little long compared to Albertosaurus. Eh, I don't know if that's a factor. <laughs> that's true. We've seen some pretty long dinosaur names. <laughs> On the city side of things, I can only find Alberta ones. I might be missing a few, but all I could find was Edmonton. And there's Edmontonia and Edmontosaurus. Those are both named after Edmonton. Or maybe the formation, because there's also an Edmonton named formation. But with the rivalry in Alberta, I'm kind of surprised there aren't any genera named after Calgary. (laughs) (laughs) Not yet, anyway. Yeah. Oftentimes, places do end up in species named, though. So there's probably like some kind of dinosaur Calgary eye or something. As a bonus, there are two famous dinosaurs that most people don't realize are named after Canada, and that's Brachylophosaurus or Brachylophosaurus canadensis. So the Mm. species name is canadensis, and that's the hadrosaur that includes Leonardo, which is quote-unquote mummified and really amazing. So definitely an amazing dinosaur find, and is named after Canada. There's also Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis. That's the type species of Pachyrhinosaurus. Which means that if any of the other species in Pachyrhinosaurus are too similar and we have to combine the names, Canadensis is going to get the priority. So there's always going to be at least two Canadensis dinosaurs. (laughs) (laughs) Brachylophosaurus only has the one species, so that's not an issue there. Unlike genus names, I should point out, which have to be unique for every animal. We talk about this. It seems to come up a lot with beetles and dinosaurs. There are just so many beetle genera that a lot of times people will name a dinosaur and then then they'll realize, oh, that was already the name of a beetle. Like I think Laylaps was one of those, some kind of invertebrate. You can't use the same genus name anywhere, regardless of how distantly related they are. But species names, you can reuse those constantly, as long as they're not in the same genus. <laughs> so like we've got at least two dinosaurs that are canadensis, and there's tons of other things that are canadensis too, like some plants and things. I was kind of surprised though, there isn't any Canadasaurus or Canadasaura yet, but maybe there will be soon. Who knows? It's got a nice ring to it. Yeah, I think it sounds pretty good. It's harder to combine like United States I guess maybe you could have like America Sora or something. Hmm. That sounds kind of weird. Yeah. I think Canada Sora sounds kind of nice. There's lots of dinosaurs out there that have yet to be named. So we'll see. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Don't forget to subscribe to I Know Dino in your favorite podcast app. Also, consider joining our growing dinosaur community on Patreon, patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Good day, I've been